in the Bible there are phrases and uh, repetitions that uh, draw our attention. In Leviticus 8, in verse 23, in the coronation or the ordination of the priesthood, the beginning of the priesthood, it says, as Moses is anointing Aaron, of course, and his sons to be priests, and he killed it, and Moses took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. And so he's taking the blood and he's putting it from his ear, his thumb, and his big toe. And then you come forward into uh, Isaiah chapter 6. And you see that um, when you have the seraphim flying above the throne of God, with two they cover their face, and with two they cover their fleet feet, and with two they fly. Let me just fly in Florida. Looking for my vent. Um, <clears throat> then when you come to Mark chapter 9, verses 42 through following, through the end of the chapter, Jesus is talking about dealing with the seriousness of sin and not playing with it and cutting it off immediately. If your right eye causes you to fend, cut it out, or pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Or if your foot causes you to sin, to remove it. In John chapter 13, when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, and Peter said, you're never going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, well, if I don't wash you, then you don't have any part with me. And Jesus said, then, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head also. There's this interesting pattern that I see of head, hands, and feet. Head, hands, and feet. The ordination of the priesthood, the covering of the head and the hands, with the, or the head and the feet with the seraphim, the eye, the hand, and the foot with the seriousness of sin, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head also. And so there seems to be <clears throat> this flow. Now, uh, a song we sang this morning for the Lord's Supper, um, which I think, when I survey the wondrous cross, is that right, Ross? Okay, I thought that's what it was. I had to take the little one to the bathroom, so I was in and out. <clears throat> and I don't know if we sang this particular verse, we might have. I may just couldn't have heard it when I had him in the bathroom. But I think it's verse 3 in in the songbook that I remember anyway, where we say in that song, see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. And so when you think about it, the head at the top of your body, your hands, when you let your arms hang down, your hands are about the center port of your body and your feet. And so there's this idea of the complete person being given over to. And when you think about the head, when you look at the priesthood of Aaron the ear, and then the big thumb, and then the big toe, the ear to hear the word of God, the thumb or the hand to do the word of God, and the feet to carry out the will of God. And so that pattern has been somewhat interesting to me uh, for a while. And so tonight I want us to consider the hands, the hands of Jesus, because Hands tell us what to do. For an example, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10, uh, Solomon said, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. So you see that hand, it's the implication of action. And so I want us to look at the hands of Jesus and see what it is he did with his hands that then informs us what we need to do with ours. And of course, some of that we're dealing metaphorically, so to speak, But we're looking at and learning directly from what he used his hands to do. And so to begin, I want us to look, and we're going to look in the Gospels together tonight. We'll flip back and forth between them. I want us to begin in Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 13. It says, And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them into his arms and blessed them and laid hands on them. And so it was a common custom that you would have uh, famous teachers or rabbis come around that they would pronounce a blessing upon your child. And part of that was laying the hand on the child the same way that if a child comes up and you interact, you might put your hand on their back or something along those lines. 
And so the first thing I see Jesus doing with his hands is that he is carrying children. The reason why I like this text as opposed to some of the others in the Gospels, because there are parallel accounts of this, is that he folds them into his arms. That's the idea behind the original text. He folds them into his arms. He hugs them. He embraces them. You know, he, Jesus loved children. He loved children. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because sometimes we can get this idea that Jesus was this stern-faced individual. Um, I've held a lot of, of children in my life. And it's kind of hard to hold a child and go, like, it just doesn't work. I mean, I suppose you can, but it makes you really strange, right? It's not a normal reaction. And so he always makes time. He invests in children. And one of the things that teaches us is the need to invest in and to, make, and to understand that children are important. Okay? That every child is important. <clears throat> that we're teaching our children the things that are right. That's the, that's the era of the judges, that disaster. If we want to know what happens when we don't teach our children, we don't have to guess. There's an entire book that's built upon that premise. There arose a generation after them that knew not the Lord. Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. Now listen, in every generation, you're always going to have some people who fail at their responsibility to teach their children. And so thus some children will grow up not to know God. But the only way that you can have an entire generation characterized by not knowing God is if there was a breakdown in the home of monumental proportions. That is, they were not teaching their children about the Lord at all, any of them. And so we see what happens when that particular problem arises and we don't teach our children and the importance of teaching them at home. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to uh, the spiritual education of our children, the Bible school program is an important part. Okay? But <clears throat> here's an example I would, I would offer and give. And that is, at, at the very best, and Bible school programs are important. I believe in them very much. But at the very best, a Bible school program is meant to be a vitamin supplement. It's not meant to be the meal. Does that make sense? That is, <clears throat> if, if our children are operating on what we only give them by bringing them to church on Sunday and Wednesday, that's feeding them twice a week. That's not enough. When Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When we're intaking the word of God, we're eating. And if Sunday and Wednesday are the only times, well, then that's, they're going to be malnourished. If we only eat twice a week, that's going to be malnourished in the physical form. And so when it comes to <clears throat> taking care of our children, it, it is a group investment. Obviously, the parents hold the primary responsibility to teach their children. The Bible school program holds a responsibility. Every age group within the church holds a responsibility to take interest in children. Okay? Uh, to let church some of their happiest memories be. I, I, I truly do, and I don't mean this in, in, in a condescending way at all, but I truly feel sorry for people who grow up and they have no memories of things they've done in the church building. Some of the greatest stories you will ever have to tell are what you have done in a church building. I, me and my brothers used to swim in the baptistry after my dad cleaned it and refilled it. That was our swimming pool. Like, look at, I mean, just all kind of stuff that you miss. The, I mean, it, and so having children at the building doing things as much as possible, that church becomes a, a positive association for them, Right? They associate the positive and that we invest in that. That's of vital importance <clears throat> that we don't treat them as an annoyance. And to be honest with you, that's not really a problem here at all. I wish I could tell you that it weren't a problem at all. But um, <laughs> I do know of a place where someone was criticized because uh, literally in their words, and it was hard for me to keep a straight face, in their words, their preacher spent too much time with the kids of the congregation and not enough time paying attention to adults. That was hard to keep a straight face with. 
but it told you something about the makeup of what they expected, and it's it unfortunately playing out for them in a not so good way. <clears throat> but anyway, so when we look at Jesus, we learn the importance of carrying children, whether physically or metaphorically in this particular sense. Number two, let's look at Matthew 8 and 9. We looked at this a little bit more in depth uh, from the vantage point of he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so what you have are these cluster of miracles, but I want you to pay attention to these miracle clusters. And let's see something here that goes on. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be cleansed. Okay, now drop down to verses 14 and 15. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. He touched her. He touched her hand. All right? Chapter 9, verses um, 18 and 19. <clears throat> the ruler comes and says, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. Then drop down to verse 24. He said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the, this report went throughout all of the district, touching Verse 27, and Jesus passed from there. Two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to him, Do you believe I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And so on and on. These are just small samples of, but Jesus is touching. He's using his hands. And so under this idea... It is that of compassionately healing the sick. The touch is a sense of compassion. And compassion is something that is needed. Straight across the board. Uh, a friend of mine when I was preaching in Oxford, <clears throat> Jason, who was our uh, youth and family minister, but a very, very smart guy. And uh, he was teaching a class doing a study on specific words throughout Scripture. And one of the things he came across uh, as we would share our studies pretty much every day, kind of talk about what was going on, what were we seeing, and stuff like that, um, <clears throat> that I had never, never dawned on. I don't think I ever would have seen it. And that is that compassion in the Old Testament is peculiarly a trait of God alone. It's a trait of God alone. It's not used to describe human beings. It's only used to describe God. And Jesus is described as being moved with compassion in the New Testament. And then we are called in Colossians chapter 3 to be compassionate. To take on the nature of God. And so what he's doing is he's investing in these people and their struggles. And so when you think about something like this in Matthew 25 of <clears throat> the judgment scene. You remember what Jesus says to those who are righteous and to those who are unrighteous. I was sick and you came to me. Or I was sick, and you did not come to me. I remember hearing Franklin Camp years ago, <clears throat> not in person, he, I think he may have been dead before I was born, but I don't, I don't know that that's right. But um, <clears throat> anyway, Franklin Camp did a, there's a whole set of, of CDs where he taught through basically the entire Bible. Um, I think he died in like First John or something like that, but he made it from Genesis to, to uh, a little bit of First John, I think. But I remember hearing him teach on Matthew 25, <clears throat> and uh, he said in that particular class something I've never forgotten. He said, um, you know, I'm ashamed to say it's taken me all these years to learn this. And he said, but in Matthew 25, when you see what Jesus is saying, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you took me in naked, and you clothed me sick and in prison, and you came to me. He said, what Jesus was saying was, you were willing to enter into the hurt of other people in order to help them heal in their hurts. And that's, when we see Jesus, we can't lay our hand on somebody and physically heal them. We don't have that ability. But we can lay our hand upon them physically in encouragement. We can lay our hand upon them metaphorically and enter into their hurts with them. And again, 
this congregation does a really good job of that, of taking care when people are sick, when people are in need, needs are met. People show up, especially as, as frustrating as it has been in a COVID era when what we would like to do is not what we can do. We can't go see people at hospitals. We can't do the things that we have wanted to do. And so here's Jesus compassionately healing the sick. All right, <clears throat> look in uh, Luke chapter 5, and this is Luke's account of what we saw in Matthew chapter 8 of the healing um, of the leper. Luke 5, beginning in verse 12. <clears throat> While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. Luke is the only uh, gospel account that tells us he was full of leprosy. That means he was in the last stages of leprosy, where he would die. Now, Luke is a physician, so you would expect him to pay attention to that detail as he relates the account. It says, when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and he begged him and said, Lord, if you, can, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. So... <clears throat> What you have here, if a man is in the final stages of his leprosy, for which there was really no cure, okay? Leprosy is a broad term, but it seems here that this man has what we commonly think of as leprosy or Hansen's disease today. And he's in the final stages of it, which means he's about to die. Do you think he was afraid? Jesus touches him. So many different layers can be analyzed from Jesus touching the leper. But one of those layers has to be a calming sense of Jesus putting his hand on him. He was afraid. Or in Matthew 17, when they're on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Peter and James and John again say, let's build three tabernacles, and God overshadows them and says no, and then they fall on their faces for fear the text says about Jesus and then he put forth his hand and touched them and told them not to be afraid and so one of the things that Jesus did with his hands was to comfort people who were afraid he comforted people who were fearful and every one of us have fear every one of us experience fear um, <clears throat> You know, there's that fine line of at what point does fear become a lack of trust? But you know, I, if I would just be honest with you, I fear dying at a young age and not being able to see my children grow up. That's a common thought I have, that I won't be able to watch them, not, not just to watch them grow up, but to be able to help them become the men that God wants them to be, to be able to, to take their questions and to try and help them. I, I, I fear that. Um, I have feared <clears throat> what has taken place in, in many congregations throughout COVID crisis. I, I, I'm, I've had moments of fear. I wish I could tell you I had just rock solid faith that I thought everything was going to work out and everything was going to be okay, but I don't have that all the time. Other people, we have our fears of, can God really forgive me? Is everything really going to be okay with whatever situation you want to insert here? One of the things we have to learn to do if we're going to do what Jesus did is to be, be there with four people and with people who are afraid. To sit with them and, to and you know, it's okay to be afraid. Talk to me about your fear. And for us to be strong enough who are fearful to open up and tell people, I'm afraid. I wish I could tell you that I was confident and I knew exactly what was going to happen, but I don't. And I'm afraid of that. But part of the ministry of Jesus was comforting people who were fearful. How many times, look through the New Testament, the Gospel accounts, and see how many times he said to people, it is I, do not be afraid or be of good cheer. 
So he's comforting the fearful. Now, we're staying in Luke 5 here. <clears throat> and let's watch Jesus connect his hands in prayer. Luke 5 and verse 16, it says, But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Luke 6 and verse 12, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. Chapter 9 and verse 18, Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. Or <clears throat> chapter 9 verse 29, now, eight days after these things, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. And on and on we could go. 11 and verse 1, Jesus was praying in a certain place. Luke is the gospel of prayer. And Luke tells us more about the prayer life of Jesus than any other gospel. <clears throat> Jesus prayed. We have to be people of prayer. How many people remember prayer meetings? Legitimate prayer meetings. Where we would come together and we would, like the whole service was dedicated to praying. Widely, the church has abandoned that practice, and I believe to our own detriment. To our own detriment. That we no longer know how to pray. That we don't, we don't even have the spiritual discipline. We think if a person leads a public prayer and it goes last 60, if it goes past 60 seconds, you know, that's just ridiculous. Then you read about Jesus continuing all night to God in prayer. Or you look at, um, I saw it again the other day, I came across it somewhere in reading, that this concept that says, you know, this is the way we do things. We draw up our plan, we talk about how we're going to execute it, and then we pray about it. But the New Testament's pattern is just the opposite. We pray about it. We let God show us what should happen. And then we do it. Prayer has to become as natural as breathing. And one of the things that Jesus shows us is that we have to continue to be in prayer individually, collectively as congregations that we understand what prayer is for. Number five, look at uh, John chapter 19. John 19 and verse 23. Simple statement. <clears throat> It says, when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them in four parts. So the soldiers had crucified Jesus. A very simple statement. But what was part of crucifying Jesus? Taking his hands and driving a tapered 12 to 18 inch iron spike through them and bending it back on the backside. The hands of Jesus went to a cross. The hands of Jesus were willing to die. They were willing to die. Now, here's the thing. We've got to be willing to do the same thing. We've got to be willing to do the same thing. Yes, hope, I mean, hope, if I'm just being honest with you, I don't want to die a martyr. I would much rather live out my days preaching in peace. But the greater challenge, in some respects, is this. Is to be willing to die to myself, to crucify myself to God every single day. If any man would come to me, let him deny himself. Let him crucify himself and take up his cross and follow me. Be willing to die to myself. What, what Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, I declare, I, did, I die daily. 
I've been crucified with Christ. Every single day when I get up, I have a decision to make. I can either put my will to death or I can bring it up to life. Every single day we have a choice about whether or not we will crucify ourselves and surrender ourselves to the will of God and what is right or to what we want to do. It is amazing to me <clears throat> the insistence that we can make on rights as an individual who has made that argument. It is amazing to me that we can make arguments about rights to a God who literally surrendered everything for us. What am I going to say to Jesus? My rights. My rights. Tell me about your rights. Tell me about them. The person who insists on their rights to live their life how they want to, that, that, that everything should go the way that they think it should go. There is a serious deficit in their understanding of who Jesus is. That at Christianity, we sign away our rights. When we come to the cross, we give them up. That's why it's said by Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. Philippians 3, everything I had that was a gain to me, I counted it as a loss. Every right that I had as a faithful Jew, I surrendered it. Every one of them. I surrendered every one of those rights. <clears throat> That's the challenge. And every one of us will struggle with that challenge every day that we live. Now to Matthew 14. Where <clears throat> Peter goes and walks on the water to meet Jesus. Verse 28. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water to come to Jesus and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, and Je but, excuse me, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? So he reaches out his hand and he saves him. He pulls him up before he sinks and is submerged. So we see Jesus' hands being involved in saving others out of concern for them. The importance of the responsibility that we have to talk about Jesus and to teach other people about Jesus. <clears throat> and evangelism discussions make us wildly uncomfortable. I understand that. You're looking at an introvert. I see people, my first thought is what? Just look down and don't bother anybody. It's not that I don't like people. But here's the thing. Jesus is not concerned with whether or not I'm an introvert. He's concerned that I do what he told me to do. And that is to talk to people about him. And that will only get easier the more that we do that. You know, I've often wondered 
it, it's kind of interesting. I, I went to school with a, a guy who is, uh, he works at um, Graymere in Columbia now, Columbia, Tennessee. That's where he's been for a while. But he did mission work before he came to school, and then he's continued in it. He's their missions minister, does foreign and local and, and things along that line. And, and we were having a conversation one day, and I told him, I said, <clears throat> you know, I, I envy what you get to do. Because there are days when I, I come in and, and I look at a, a pile of work that's waiting on me. And it's not a complaint in any stretch of the imagination. I look at a pile of work that's waiting on me. And I sometimes wonder if I shouldn't stop preaching and just spend my life going up to people, especially to downtrodden people, and just sitting next to them and say, can I talk to you about Jesus? That maybe my life wouldn't be better spent if that's what I did with it every single day. Was walking up to people and saying, can I talk to you about Jesus? Because in our concern, if, if we're going to follow the example of Jesus, he entered into the lives of people. He taught them who he was. Then we want to close in Matthew 3. Matthew chapter 3. This is John the Baptist speaking about Jesus. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 11, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear the threshing floor, but gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And so, <clears throat> this, this old practice, this old farming practice, where you had your threshing floor, right? Where uh, Many times it was nothing more than really compacted earth. And they would lay their grain across it. And the oxen would walk across it and crush out the grain. And so after they had done that for a while, the farmer goes and gets the winnowing fork. And he takes it and he throws all of it. He scoops it up and he throws it all in the air. And the evening wind drives the chaff away, the worthless stuff. And the grain is heavy enough to withstand the wind and it falls back down to the ground. And then you gather that up and that's how they would go through that process. Now, John uses that image to describe what Jesus is going to do with every single one of us one day. He's going to take his winnowing fork and he's going to toss us up to the air of judgment. And if there is no legitimacy to our lives, the wind is going to carry us away from his presence forever. But if there is legitimacy in us, we will come back down to him and be welcomed to him. His hands will one day complete the judgment of the entire world. And so when we look at the hands of Jesus, we learn about what it is we're supposed to be doing. And so I think the question that we have to ask for ourselves tonight, first of all, is if a person is outside of Christ, they need to take his hand. It's extended. And it remains extended. But it will not remain extended forever. So if a person is willing to believe the gospel and repent of their sins and confess Jesus to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins, that's Jesus rescuing them, pulling them out. Galatians 1 and verse 4, that Jesus rescued us from this present evil age. Or maybe as New Testament Christians, <clears throat> if we were to be winnowed tonight, if God were, if Jesus were to take his winnowing fork and to cast us into the air, there wouldn't be enough weight for us to survive the wind of judgment. Maybe that's something we need to, to address. So as we think about the hands of Jesus tonight, What are we going to do?
They've been extended on a cross, and they've been extended in an offer. Are we going to accept it, or are we going to reject it and take judgment instead? That's up to us. If you want to accept that invitation tonight, we're glad to help you. If we can, let us know as we stand and sing this song.